What's up, Coachable family? Welcome back to the Coachable Podcast. I'm your host, Tori Gordon, and today is a unique conversation. It's going to be a special one. It's one I have been really looking forward to for months now because we have Dr. Shafali here tuning in from New York City um, to be a part of this conversation. Dr. Shafali is somebody I have personally looked up to for years since I came across her work. And just to give you a little bit of background on her, if you don't already know who she is, she received her doctorate in clinical psychology from Columbia University, specializing in the integration of Western psychology and Eastern philosophy. She brings together the best of both worlds for her clients. And she is, in my opinion, the go-to expert in family dynamics and personal development. She teaches courses around the globe to millions of people. And she's written four books, three of which are New York Times bestsellers, uh, including two Hallmark books, The Conscious Parent, The Awakened Family, and one of my personal favorites, favorites, A Radical Awakening. This is going to be so juicy, so full of actionable takeaways that you can apply to your life, to your relationships, so that you can have a life that feels as good as it looks that starts on the inside. So thank you, Dr. Shafali, for taking time to be with us today. I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome to the show. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Of course. So as I said, I've been I've been an admirer of yours for years and your work. It's changed my life. And I don't say that, um, you know, softly. It, it, truly what you do helps us, helps me, helps everyone who hears it awaken to our truth and evolve, which to me really means to come home to the truth of who we are before we were told who we needed to be um, by the world and really decode and unlearn so many of the lives that lies that we've grown up believing in. I would love just to get your take on what does it mean to awaken uh, what does it mean to start an awakening journey, a spiritual journey? Um, and what typically leads to that moment when the light turns on and we start to awaken within? Well, I wish the light could just turn on. <laughs> but for most people, it's a very slow and arduous process of a lot of pain. Mm. So I, I honor pain because it does take us to an awakening in most cases, some people just can't handle the pain, but many of us use the pain or the pain uses us to eventually awaken. Mm. So what it means to awaken is to realize that the ways in which we have been conditioned until now are not working and to dare to re-examine them, right? Yeah. So many of us are aware, but then we don't dare. So awakening involves an awareness and a daring mm. to say, you know, is this correct? And then uh, maybe everything is working in our lives, but we still owe it to ourselves to re-examine the ways in which we have been conditioned because we owe it to ourselves to, to repurpose, you know, re-channel what our parents have given us and not just accept it at face value. So that's what it means to awaken, to become aware of your conditioning, to dare to break it. And typically a lot of pain will do the work. Yeah, that has been my personal path to awakening. Um, and I've heard you say that there are two ways that we can come to this, right? We can consciously choose it and we can just kind of be um, more inclined to question life and be that seeker and want to understand kind of our place and how we fit. And we maybe more naturally follow our curiosities um, versus having life kind of jolt us into an awakening by saying, hey, this is so painful. We've got, there has to be another way. And if there has to be another way, what does that way look like? And I know it starts with examining all of those things within us. Would you say for those listening, the place to start is looking at what's not working in your life as a, as a starting ground? Well, you know, it's, it is a wonderful opportunity when things don't go well mm -hmm. to begin to, to look them in the eye because it's so obvious, right? Right. 
Uh, your your partner is not coming home at all. It's obvious. Mm -hmm. Your partner is drinking too much. It's obvious. You have put on too much weight and your eating is out of control. It's obvious. Mm -hmm. You are exhausted and stressed and reacting, screaming at your child. It's obvious. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're still there. Oh, sorry. Okay. So you have to edit this part. You, you disappeared for a moment, so I don't know what happened. That's okay. We'll um, edit it out. So, so when... So when things are obvious, our typical tendency is to hide and run mm -hmm. and deny mm -hmm. and suppress. But those of us who are daring and brave can begin to say, hmm, does this have anything to do with me? And that's really the pivotal starting point mm -hmm. to turn that spotlight within and to dare to examine, am I creating this? Mm -hmm. What Did I have other choices? Why do I keep falling into the same pattern? What about my history, my past, my fears is causing me to co-create this present moment? Mm. So you have to ask some questions. You have to be somewhat of a seeker. Mm. Um, but it's lovely when it's really dysfunctional because it's so obvious. Like you can only hide so much. So whenever things go really wrong and I'm hating it in my own life or my client is hating it in their life, I also introduce the um, awareness that this is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Good you saw that your partner is lying to you. Good you saw that your child is so anxious and they lied to you and didn't go to school, but they said they did. These are wake-up calls. These mm -hmm. are red flags that are here to alert us and jolt us into an awakening. But most of us, don't want to see the red flags because we superimpose the red flags with a story. And the story is, oh, no, they didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. She didn't mean it. It's not really anxiety. It's not really bad. I feel bad. And the reason we superimpose our stories is because we have been so habituated to living in the lie. Mm -hmm. So many people pleasers, for example, will keep making stories, keep avoiding conflict. And that's not because they're nice people or better than others. It's because they're wearing the mask. The, and that mask obscures their ability to see the truth. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I have found that has personally helped me um, kind of keep, keep peeling back the onion, if you will, right? Keep looking at all of the the illusions, the the lies, the beliefs that I cling so tightly to that give me some false sense of comfort or control <laughs> in my life. And, and this is something I've been thinking a lot about, but it's this idea of keeping truth as the North Star in my life, right? And I'd like to get your take on this, but for me, it's like, how do I make truth the, the most important thing? Even if that truth means it's going to be mean I have to leave this relationship now or this friend friendship is no longer going to be a thing. Maybe uh, it means I'm out of alignment in my career or my integrity. But if I keep truth as the thing that I continually seek after in, in staying uh, connected to, then whatever ends as a byproduct of, of living in that truth is the best thing that could happen for me and for everybody involved. Now, I understand that that's not always the easy, like I, I've kind of been doing this work for <laughs> on myself for a little while. Not everybody has that perspective, but can you give kind of your sense on that and, and how we can start to orient towards truth versus cling to our false sense of identity and comfort and control in our lives? Well, the real truth is often very hard to confront, digest, yeah. and radiate with, yeah. manifest. So I agree with you that truth needs to be our North Star and we need to follow the truth. But here's the thing. For some people, the truth is their God. For somebody else, it's their way of life. Yeah. But that's what we're talking about, that at least follow your truth, right? Even though it may not be the truth, for example, somebody may 
be a capitalist and want to destroy the earth because their truth is to make money. So we know that that is not the truth. Sure. It is just their truth. Right. But most of us are not even living our truth. We're living other people's truth. We're living the politician's truth or our parents' truth or culture's truth, our partner's truth. Mm. So the first step is to really quieten down and begin to listen. Well, what do I believe in? This is what the church says. This is what the synagogue says. This is what my mom says. What do I believe in? So first you have to really become still to begin that inquiry. Mm. And then as we become more and more clear about our truth, we can become more and more clear about the truth. But the truth is not always our truth. You know, it could be a fundamentalist anti-Semite. And his truth is that, you know, he's anti-Semitic. Mm. We all know that that's just his truth. It's not the truth. Right. So there's our truth, but the real, the real place we want to arrive at is the truth. And the truth is only digested by very few mm. because people don't want to hear the real truth and it's too provocative for them. For example, my book, A Radical Awakening, wasn't uh, allowed in some countries because of a few pages of too much provocative truth mm. and people didn't like it. So it's not available in that whole country now. So um, truth is very hard and people mistake their truth to the truth. There's a big difference. Yeah. Many times. I'm so glad you made that point because it, that is true. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. um, without a better way to say it, it's, it's so real um because so many of us are even just disconnected from what's true for us and we've become so associated and identified with what we've been told um and i i really believe that this awakening process in my own experience has been um uh identifying and getting curious about and really looking at what do I believe? What's the different, what's important? Like, how do I identify what's important versus what I've been told is important? <laughs> right? Yes, yes. Right. And many people don't ever arrive at even asking that because they're just so afraid of looking outside their blinders, right? So they're so afraid to step out of that conformity and for many people around the world, stepping out really means physical danger. Mm -hmm. So we have to have understanding and compassion for some people's issues. Absolutely. But um, for the rest of us who are not in physical danger, we owe it to ourselves to ask, well, what is true for me? You know, does this work for me? At least let's arrive there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I want to talk about relationships specifically. It's been a theme on this show, uh, especially as of late. And I think you are uh, very much a, you know, a qualified expert to speak on this topic. I'd love to understand what does it mean to be conscious within a relational dynamic, specifically a romantic one? Well, to be conscious uh, is, is something that uh, is, like you said, an onion that can be peeled at many layers. So at the very basic layers, basic, basic, and people don't even do this, is to understand that a lot of our partnerships and relationships will be based on our patterns from childhood. Mm -hmm. So we would like to think they are based on free will and conscious choice. And, uh, you know, this, this thing called love, but for the most part, it's just us repeating a pattern that we were comfortable with from childhood. Mm. So first that's like basic one-on-one, which for many is a big shock and an epiphany to even arrive at. Mm -hmm. Then we have to understand that often we attract people, uh, to help us work through our own stuff, right? We will attract people that force us to grow and we won't like it. So we have an opportunity there to either leave them or to learn what we are here to learn with them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, another thing that we need to become conscious of is that people don't owe us anything. They don't owe us their loyalty, fidelity, allegiance, love, even respect. The only people we can demand that from is ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we need to become conscious of the fact that 
marriage can end and people can change and that's okay. Mm. Uh, we need to be conscious of the fact that we are most healthy when we are most free. And when we are being controlled or are controlling another, we are actually not being the most free and therefore not being the most healthy. Mm. Healthy relationships are based on such a high degree of, of matching and alignment and an understanding that we are here to evolve, not here to possess, not here to control. Um, and I think if you can get that straight, then every relationship you're in is going to be a success because you're going to be evolving in such beautiful ways. Mm. Yeah. But if you use the relationship to heal you, if you use the relationship as your therapist or your mother, you're going to not only not evolve, you're going to be stuck in toxicity over and over again because you're searching for something that the other person doesn't have a responsibility or obligation to give you. Mm -hmm. You know, we think that they're obligated to take care of us. No, they're not. Yep. So true. So how do we start to investigate that, especially whether someone's in a relationship or maybe they recently exited a relationship for whatever reason, and maybe they're trying to do some reflection on how did I end up here? Why did this end? Or what was I meant to learn from this? How can we start to identify where we need to take responsibility and maybe where we're projecting or having these expectations of a partner that they're really not meant to fulfill so that we can be in partnership with each other, not in relationship with each other's wounds? Very good. Very good. Well, you know, uh, your body will tell you, mm. your mood will tell you, your fear will tell you, you know, ask yourself in the last 24 hours with this person, was I completely as comfortable as possible as I could be with another human being? Mm. Was I tippy toeing? Was I lying? Was I suppressing? Was I denying? Was I inauthentic? And that's your first clue as to how much you are in a role versus in your soul, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So you can ask how much of my relationship is based on my fear of being alone versus my desire to be with this person. How much of my relationship is here is, is in my life because that's what I think I should do or it's because I desire to do mm. or how much of my being here is all about just a robotic, you know, old pattern. Um, and how much is it about mutual growth and respect and enhancement and enrichment? And, you know, people will say, oh, that's so selfish. Why should you only be with people who, who enhance you? And my answer to that is why not? Mm. You know, you don't have to dump the person. You don't have to be rude to the person. And you don't have to stop loving and caring for the person. But you don't have to be there if it's not enhancing you. Uh, and I don't mean this in a self-centered, absorbed way that, you know, they need to buy you diamonds and, and you know, Bentleys. I mean this in the, on the soulful level. If somebody is not aligned with your soul, you can love them, but you can also leave. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Or you can change the dynamic. People are so afraid to change the dynamic. So many marriages are just brother, sister, roommate relationships. But that's fine. But don't pretend it's not then. Right. And that's fine, too. Yeah. Let's not call it so, something else. Yeah. And if you want to, you can do whatever you want. But, you you know, if it doesn't serve a purpose. Sure. And I'm not saying that everyone should go find a soul partner in that way that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. It's OK to be alone, too. It's OK to just be in community. It's OK to just live with your friends. It's OK to uh, be a, a parent and live with other parents. You know, we can redefine the form of it. This isolated nuclear couple, exclusive, I live in my house with my washing machine and my, you know, ironing board and my generator and my AC, and then you live five feet away, but in your house with your dishwasher, your husband, your, you know, it's ridiculous, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you can keep the husband, but let's share the appliances <laughs> and, and even just let's share everything. Really, yeah. actually, that's how it used to be. But this extreme isolation is just just a duplication of resources and plain bad economics and economics of 
of resources, economics of, uh, you know, courage, economics of what we can become, right? It's, it's, it's scaling down all our potential. Yeah. And how much, you know, I think about how much suffering is, is how much um, dysfunction is happening within those individual homes, you know, oh. in one neighborhood. Oh, yeah. And we feel, I know how many times did, I mean, I knew I grew up when there was conflict in our family and it would happen in, you know, uh, behind closed doors in our home or in our car. And then it's like, okay, let's put on a, a happy face before we go out and see everyone else. So, so often, you know, that dysfunction or that, that, um, those challenges are happening in the privacy of your homes and no one knows. And it's this silent, you know, gate that is, you know, we, we have to respect because we don't want to make the family or the relationship look bad to anybody else. And we're all kind of trying to save face so that we can make it look a certain way to our neighbors or to our friends or to our community when we're all so desperate to be liberated from that and be like, hey, this is what's actually happening, yet we're so afraid of it. We want it. We desire it. We want to be free from, you know, the what you call a lot of times slavery, the, the, the bondage of thinking we have to look and be perceived a certain way and fit into what culture has deemed the right type of relationship. And if we are honest not just with everyone else, but even with ourselves, we start to create a story about what does that mean about me? And why am I not able to function healthily in this dynamic? And I'm like, hmm, I'd love to see someone who is <laughs> actually functioning healthily in those dynamics to give a reference point because so often people are suffering in silence in my experience. Right. And we're, we're suffering in silence because we're all craving approval and worth from the others, not realizing that the others are craving approval and worth from you. Now, do you, so we're can, all, I, can, I just, I heard that word and I want to tap into it. I heard, heard you talk about something called the triple threat. Can mm -hmm. you speak about that? Um, acceptance, validation, and praise. Now, approval is not part of yes. that, but how does maybe yes. the triple yes. threat uh, play a role in that? Yes. Right. So in my book, A Radical Awakening, I, I speak to this incessant craving that we have for this, you know, approval, acceptance, or, you know, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it, validation and praise. And that's what we are looking for. And that's why we hide and we lie and we suppress and we deny and we fake it mm -hmm. because we are so afraid of not getting that which we think we need, but we really don't, but we think we need it. And we are enslaved, bonded to that need. Mm -hmm. And the moment you realize that the person and the people you're seeking it from are really more broken or as broken as you, then maybe you wake up and go, why am I begging these people to love me? when they're half asked, half broken, half together themselves. Right. Where did this hunger come from? And why am I going to, a, it's like going, you're so hungry, you have you know, a million dollars and you're willing to eat at a really uh, poorly laid buffet table with rotted food and mold. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how we are. We are worth a million dollars, for example, and then we're going to you know, suck on the, on the breasts of people who are empty. Yeah. They have no honey, no milk to give us. Mm -hmm. um, and we accept crumbs because that's how little we think of ourselves. So my book, A Radical Awakening, really helps women elevate and improve and work on that muscle so that they can begin to elevate themselves to a degree that they're not eating at a moldy table full of bad, rotted food, but they're going to at least go sit at the table where they serve beautiful food and then even more where they, you know, it's a luxury hotel. And I don't mean this in terms of money. I just mean this in terms of their inner worth, yep. that they deserve more. And when we realize we deserve more, then we allow ourselves, we permit ourselves um, opportunities to get more. Mm. And it doesn't mean money. And I'm not talking about wealth and I'm not talking about things. I'm talking about what we we stop compromising on getting the moldy, rotten food. We mm -hmm. stop compromising. Mm -hmm. We say no more. Mm -hmm. I need to eat well 
I need to be in a relationship where I feel good, where I flow. And yeah, I may have to give up the fact that I have a companion, but I'm willing to give up a companion um, and I'll keep loving the companion, but I want a real flowing relationship. So again, people will have to make that choice. They will have to come out of their denial that the moldy, rotten food is amazing. Mm -hmm. They'll have to say, this is moldy, rotten food. They'll have to ask themselves, why am I willing to keep eating moldy, rotten food? And then the answer will be, because I'm just so scared. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to have to work on that little girl or little boy inside and help them grow up. And, um, you know, I, I do private coaching. That's what your podcast is about. Yep. I have an institute. Because we need to help people to grow that little child up and make that child believe they can do it. Yeah. They don't have to compromise and they don't have to eat bad food for the rest of their life. So true. And that has been a journey for me. You know, I've watched myself go through many relationships, um, accepting less than I deserve. And it's sad. It's sad now looking back. And I grieve and I have so much compassion for the the little girl in me that thought that that was all that I was worth, you know. Um, but what I've learned is that I will always get what I tolerate. You know, yes. I will yes. always get what I tolerate. We give permission. Yeah. Yep. That we give I permission. am we... participating in this. Yes, yes. And that's what I really emphasize in my book, A Radical Awakening, is that we are not to be victimized in any way by ourselves, by our own tyranny. Mm. We need to liberate ourselves by understanding that we are co-creators in most of our situations. Now, children are not co-creators. Pets are not co-creators. You know, the people in the Holocaust were not co-creators. Right. The black slaves from Africa were certainly not co-creators. They didn't have a so, choice. And, and for generations that come after, are not co-creators really mm -hmm. because they are they are living the legacy of what came before now of course there is some level of co-participation but when we want to take a need to take radical accountability we need to understand that barring the wife who's being beaten up by her husband and even she and barring the holocaust survivor and even them and barring the slave and even them most of us need to take complete co-creation responsibility mm -hmm. And even those people who have suffered, and even if you get raped tomorrow, you know, heaven forbid, or I get raped, heaven forbid. Yes, we that was not our co-creation, but after the event, every moment after is our co-creation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we need to remember the power we have within and, and really use it to suffer less. Mm -hmm. There is so much power we have to suffer less, but we just need to know the pathway to do that. Well, the question I invite myself and my clients and those listening to this show to ask um, is how do I participate in the creation of my own happy unhappiness or own suffering? Like, what is my role yeah. in that? And part of it, ha you know, requires me to look at all the ways I love to sit on the throne of my victimhood and be like, you did this to me, you know, you hurt me, you betrayed me, you wronged me and turn a blind eye to all of the ways in which I continued to stay or I continued to tolerate it or accept that level of treatment and not remove myself. And I think part of that peeling back of the onion is saying no more, like I'm not going to be the one that continues to put myself in these positions and create unnecessary suffering, but it requires you to let go of the need to blame everybody else for yeah. the results that you're getting in your life. And that's a hard pill to swallow. Very hard. Blaming someone does give a moment of dopamine and, you know, you can breathe, you can feel righteous, you can feel justified. So I can see the benefits of blaming other people. Because we can but feel like it's around, not our fault because we can be like, oh, yeah, this wasn't this wasn't yeah. me doing this. It was you. Correct. And some people are real assholes. Sure. So it is it's not wrong. But after that, the inevitable question is, OK, now what? Mm -hmm. And that comes 
with you taking action mm -hmm. in a different way, right? Okay, fine. They're terrible. They're malignant narcissists. They're abusive. They're corrupt. Okay, you're right. I validate you. And we need to validate ourselves. Mm -hmm. But then what, right? The now what involves you. So now you have 15 choices. You can rage. You can become an alcoholic. You can become really depressed. You can give up. You can stay with them uh, and continue to be abused. You can, you know, get a new job, move, move state. This so there's 16, 17 choices now, and that's really what we don't like because making a choice means being an adult. Yes. And it's so much easier to keep blaming and waiting for the other to change. Blaming and waiting. You know, we play the game and the the game of wait and blame. Mm. Wait and blame. And keep waiting. Keep blaming. But the hard thing is to mobilize action mm -hmm. and to generate change because those are adult qualities. Mm -hmm. And that's really hard for most of us because we are still so paralyzed within um, that we cannot activate true adult change. Yeah. And I think that goes back to what, what activates and allows us to really step into the awakening is not just the awareness, but you said it's you have to be aware and you have to dare to do something about it. And that means yes. making a choice and, and being yes. accountable to that choice and then living that choice out. And so many of us, we want to stay in that indecision. We want to continue to straddle the fence. We want to continue to have the best of both worlds, you know, and um, I see, and that's where the paralysis comes in, really. Like you can't move in any direction because you're, you're just stuck. And that seems yeah. to be such a theme. And one, one of the things I, I've um, found is really interesting in terms of reclaiming my power as a woman, especially in relational dynamics, is there was so much of, um, for me, there was such a time where I was really hyper fixated on being chosen, right? Uh, mm. I, I, I wanted someone to stay. I wanted them to see my value. I wanted them to see me as a good person pick a good partner. Like, why wouldn't you want to be with me? And I, and I, there was a part of me that really wanted to prove that. And I felt the need to prove that. And then it came to a point where I was like, okay, if this person chose me fully, do I choose them? Right. You know, we, we forget that so often, especially as women, we get so hyper fixated on being chosen that we, we completely, uh, lose the sense that are we actually like is this a person that we're choosing if they were to right. you know do we want them as much as we want to be wanted and um right. when we ask Most that question it's illuminating be, yes yes it's a great question most of us just want to be wanted mm -hmm. we desire to be desired <laughs> and we don't even care who the person on the other side is yeah uh, and that's what I was speaking to this hunger for that mm -hmm. approval, validation and praise mm -hmm. that we're not even we have no criteria, you know, and one of the criteria needs to be that if the other person doesn't want us more than us, we shouldn't want them. <laughs> um, right. That should be one of the top criteria. First, let me see how much they want me. Mm -hmm. Then I'll even be interested mm -hmm. because I only want to be with someone who wants to be with me. I'm not going to keep running after someone, but that takes years and years to cultivate because our self-esteem is so low that we're starting from such a low place that we take any low hanging fruit. Mm -hmm. You know, we take the neighbor, we take the roommate at college. We're like, okay, just can you like me for the rest of my life and let's play house. Or we take the situationship, and, you know, so many people yes. find themselves in these, these dynamics or these situationships where there aren't clear agreements and there aren't clear boundaries and they are not sure where they stand with people. And we accept that as like, oh, but that's, you know, at least I'm not alone or at least they're giving me these breadcrumbs or this attention and we're stuck in this toxic, like push and pull with these people instead of sitting back and being like, what do I really want? <laughs> what do I really want? And this is not it. And being willing to walk away and be alone. Right. Um, until right. something matches, right. you know, the standard that right. we, we right. hold for ourselves. Right. We all want a connected relationship. We yeah. all want to be respected and deemed worthy and somebody to desire us. But equally important, we need to know all the things we don't want. 
Yeah. And number one on that don't want is for us to run after them or for us to crave them or for us to wait too long for them. That should be number one on the list. Mm -hmm. What are the things I don't want to be doing? Ah, I don't want to be making excuses for the other person. Ah, I don't want to wonder where they are because they won't tell me. Ah, I don't want to wonder if they're lying or cheating or betraying me. I don't want to, I don't want to wonder. Yeah. And if you start wondering, then that should be your red flag. Mm. But we forget to create a list of things that are qualities of how the relationship makes us feel. Mm -hmm. We're so fixated on the qualities of the other person, which are just form based. Oh, I want nice eyes and a good sense of humor. And I like them to have some style. Okay, none of this matters in terms of, of course, it's, it's superficial, but, and it does matter, but it's very small. But none of it really matters in terms of how you're going to feel mm. in this relationship. And part of what we want to write down is all the things I, the ways I want to feel mm -hmm. in this relationship and the ways I don't want to feel. And if I end up feeling that way, I need to take action. Right. But we don't think in those terms because we just care about the cars and the jewelry and the roses and the marriage and the wedding day, mm -hmm. you know, but we forget to really do the homework to spend that time to do I want to feel like this? Does this feeling allow me to be my best self? Right. Uh, am I truly growing with this person? Are we aligned? Is this person doing their inner work? And we don't ask these questions. So we end up with what we were looking for, which is the form based mm -hmm. attraction, which is most of us in our 20s mm -hmm. get beguiled by the surface, you know, or we went to school together, or we have we worked in the same restaurant. And but that, those are not the things that are going to sustain you. Right. I hope you guys are listening to this because this, these are the questions you must be asking yourself if you want to have a life that feels as good as it looks. What is the point of having a boyfriend or a husband or a marriage or relationship or a job, car, whatever, that looks so good, but you feel like crap when you are participating in that thing? It doesn't, it's not going to fulfill you in the ways that you you want it to and i am a byproduct at like i stand here today and I, i'm sure you too dr chevalier to some extent like on the other side of learning the lesson that that thing i think i want so badly is not gonna i, I want it because i think it's gonna give me a feeling <laughs> like i, I we want the relationship because we think it's going to make us feel connected or give us intimacy or da 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 da, da right? And right. part of it, so we're constantly chasing a feeling that we want to experience and that we want to feel. And yes. if we are not, if the first way to know if you're out of alignment is to, to feel not the way you want to feel. It looks a certain way, but it doesn't feel like it looks right yeah so to be to be brave enough people know people know that it feels yucky yeah i'm feeling inauthentic i'm bullshitting here but we cover that up immediately with some story mm -hmm. right with some lie because we're too terrified to really say no this is rotten food mm -hmm. you know this relationship ah is not what i thought it would be or this person may not really, really want me the same way I want them. Mm -hmm. And we feel so bad about that truth that we then double down and work even harder to make sure that that person doesn't leave us instead of allowing the person to be left mm -hmm. or leave them or they leave. And it's okay to release people, but we're so scared of releasing people because we have this model that only long-term relationships are strong. Only long-term relationships are healthy. And that is such uh, an artifact of primitive conditioning. Mm. And uh, or we have the, the mantra that only married people are in strong relationships. If you're committed, you have to put a ring on it, right? Now that's just a whole load of bullshit too. Um, you can be very, very committed to someone. And in fact, you're so committed, you don't need to be married. Right. Because you actually don't need it. Yeah. Um, so people need to evolve to come to that state, though, of comfort, mm -hmm. of defying culture, of living according to their own terms. That takes a lot of inner work and a lot of uh, inner power. Uh, but that's where liberation lies. I agree. I agree. What advice do you have to someone 
to people who want to be in conscious partnership, but maybe they've never been in one. Maybe all of their relationship have, has always, um, you know, to some degree been trauma bonded or we're in relationship with each other's wounds or we've attracted each other because there's this unhealed part of ourselves. And maybe they're, they're like, okay, I want to do this differently this time, right? I want to um, come with my best self. I've, I've been working on myself so that I can enter into a conscious partnership so that I can attract a conscious partner who's also doing the work. Um, but they've never experienced that before. What advice do you have for them? And maybe are there any myths or lies that they might even have about what a conscious partnership is going to be like uh, that you can kind of illuminate? Like maybe we think it's going to be all easy when we finally get a conscious partnership or when we finally find that person that's also working on themselves, right? What are maybe some of the ideas that yes. people could have that aren't true? Yeah, I think the idea that there is, that conflict is bad. Mm. Conflict is not bad. A lot of conflict is bad. Unresolved, perpetual tension is bad. But some conflict is actually healthy. Mm. And you want to know that the person can work through it with you. That's really the key. Can I work through my conflict and resolve it? Because both people are willing to see their part and come to terms. Mm. And I would say if somebody's out there wanting a conscious relationship, work on yourself first and really give yourself uh, the space and the time to develop your own inner connection to yourself so that when you do get into a relationship, you're not entering with hunger, mm. entering with lack and scarcity, but you're really grounded to yourself. And and I would say for the first year of any relationship, just keep keep it open, keep it easy, keep it flowing. Don't start thinking about having babies with that person right away. Mm. Give it time because nothing really gets revealed till like six to eight months after you meet someone. Mm. So the first six to eight months is just, you know, it's just that chemistry, the dopamine talking, um, the sizzle, everyone is showing their best face. And then after eight to nine months is when you begin to see the person in their truth. And that's when you then actually are starting the relationship yeah. and then give yourself another year <laughs> and then decide how you want to proceed. Take mm -hmm. your time mm -hmm. because for the most part, most relationships in the beginning phases at least are all about blind projection, which is what I need, who I think I should attract, who I think you should be versus who the person really is. Yeah, that is such good advice. Is there any indicator, any measurable thing that we can look to to tell us we're ready, like we are ready for partnership or that we're ready to, like we've done, a work, a, we've done enough, have enough awareness We've dared enough to work on certain aspects of ourselves that says, okay, now you're ready for a partnership and to, to actually enter into one. Is I, there anything we can look to, think, to tell us that? Yeah. I think when you begin to speak the truth, mm. no matter how uncomfortable, mm. when you are very much in love with yourself, yeah. when you don't look at anyone outside of you as better than you or worse than you, um, when you really are ready to be alone, that's when you're ready to be in a relationship. I love it. This is so good. So practical, so real and honest. I want people to know how they can learn more about your work and your writings, your workshops. Cause I, I really believe like we could just skim the surface. I could go on and on with you and I want to respect your time. Um, obviously. So can you please tell people what you're excited about, what you're currently working on and how people can get involved in, um, more of your work? Well, one of my, my biggest achievements really is I have a coaching institute and I coach people to become their own coach and to actually become a coach, a mm -hmm. life coach. So they can look it up on my website, drshafali.com. It's a fabulous program. It's five months, it's online, and it's super transformative for people who want to do this work or learn the language better. Mm. Uh, also, every year I throw an annual summit. It's uh, three days long. It's if, called Evolve. It's coming in October this, this year. Mm. So if people want to meet me in person, really do the work in a group, in a community, uh, that's the place to find me or they can just find me. I have tons of courses. I've written five books. You can find me on Instagram uh, at Dr. Shafali, spell out doctor, mm -hmm. or look me up on drshafali.com. Okay. 
We will put all of that information in the show notes, make it super easy for you guys to get in touch and involved with Dr. Shafali's work so that you can do your own inner work so you can build a life that feels as good as it looks. It's possible. There is a path. There is a roadmap. And Dr. Shafali has given us just a taste of what that looks like and how we can start to apply the work to our own lives and relationships. I hope, as I say every single week, that you don't just listen to this information. You go apply it. You use it. You ask yourself these questions. You sit and listen to the truth that's inside of you because we all have an internal compass. Life is always speaking to us. It's just asking us, are we going to listen? I hope you do this week. I love you. Thank you, Dr. Shafali, again for being here. Till next week, you guys, go be coachable. I'll see you next week on the Coachable Podcast.